Hi everyone, I hope you all are doing well. In this video we're going to talk about a concept called recursion. Recursion is very important in computer science. It's a way of solving problems that's a little bit different than uh, the normal algorithmic approaches you have used so far. And some of you may have encountered incursion or been introduced or recursion uh, in 131, but we'll talk about it a little more in this class because it's going to be uh, a mechanism that we can use to solve some common problems with our data structures. Okay, so as we get started, um, go to the module for this video and make sure that you have downloaded the Python file that's there because we're going to be typing in some code. And then also download the recursion worksheet. Uh, I would encourage you to print out that worksheet. I think it's four pages. Um, you can also edit it in a Word document would be fine as well. Okay. All right, so what is recursion? Um, recursion is a method of solving problems that involves breaking a problem down into smaller and smaller pieces until you get to a small enough problem that you can solve easily, right? Um, okay, so that's a lot of words. Uh, what does it mean? What does it look like? Well, when you have recursion in code, what you are talking about is writing a function or method that does something, and that function calls itself inside itself. Okay? So that is the essence of recursion, right? Um, we'll go in an example here in a minute. Why on earth would you want to do this? What is it used for? Okay, so the main way that we have solved complex problems to date is via iteration, right? So if you think that you have a collection of something and you want to do something to every item in that collection, you iterate over that collection and do something. Maybe you can search it, maybe you can find the max, uh, maybe you can change the values of everything. Um, recursion can be used to solve similar problems and in fact any problem that you can solve using iteration, you can solve with recursion. Again, think of recursion as a fancy method that just calls itself until it solves the problem, right? So why recursion? Well, sometimes some problems are easier uh, to reduce into smaller ones to solve using a strategy called divide and conquer, right? So make the problem smaller and smaller and smaller. It's just easier to think about the solution that way right? Uh, not for everything, but for some problems. And we will see some examples of those, particularly in the coming parts of the class. Um, some problems have a very elegant recursive solution, meaning you write methods that solve the problem by calling themselves on smaller and smaller pieces of the problem versus iterating over the whole list or what have you, right? Um, may not seem intuitive right now, but there are things that we will encounter for sorting uh, data collections and also trees. When we get to trees at the end of the class, uh, algorithms that operate on a tree data structure are much easier to write recursively than they are iteratively, right? So, all right, here's an example, right? We have already talked about binary search and we looked at a iterative binary search algorithm, right? So just to kind of illustrate a little bit, we had this uh, slide in a previous lecture. If you want a binary search, right? We've got Mario and his blocks. And whenever he jumps on a block, what he learns is the mushroom is either to the left or to the right of wherever he jumps, right? So the iterative solution to binary search, which we went about before, is we start with the whole collection of blocks, and then in the first collection, he jumps to the middle, and he learns, then, excuse me, in the first iteration, he jumps to the middle, he learns the mushroom is to the right. In the second iteration, he jumps over here into the middle of this group, and here he learns it's to the left of that. And then finally, in the third iteration, he jumps to this middle slot, and then he finds the mushroom. Right? So this was iterative. It's dealing with the whole list each time. Right? And if you remember your binary search algorithm, you had these two um, variables that were keeping track of, well, where's the beginning of the list, the first item that we're going to look at, and where's the last item? And we moved that first item and the last item 
as we narrowed down our search. This is a divide and conquer strategy. Okay. Well, the recursive solution kind of looks like this, but it's got a fundamentally different premise, right? So we're going to start at the same place here, right? And so we tell Mario to kind of do the same thing, jump to the middle in order to learn where something about where the mushroom is. Okay, so we're calling our recursive function. And here my recursive function is called search. And I search on the list, which is going to be this thing. It's my variable holding this thing, right? So in my first recursive call, I'm searching the list, which means jump here and find out is the mushroom to the right or to the left? Well, I learned that it is to the right. Okay. Now, the recursive step, the kind of big different part of this is rather than keeping the whole list, what we will do is we will call search again, but we will only search on this part of the list, right? So effectively, what this means is that all the rest of the list is gone from the computer's perspective, right? The function, when it gets called, it only knows that this list from start to finish exists, okay? So it only looks at this piece. Well, okay, so now it applies its exact same algorithm. The code is exactly the same because it's calling the same function. So the body of the function is the same. It jumps to the middle and it learns, hey, the list the mushroom must be over here, kind of to the left of Mario, okay? But it still hasn't found it. So it will, once again, call the search method, but it's only gonna search this little piece, right? And so it does search this little piece, right? And the rest is gone from the perspective of the computer, and it finds the mushroom. At this point, we don't call search anymore because we found it we're done. In the iterative version of binary search, this terminated our loop. But here, in a recursive call, we've reached what we call the base case. We've so solved it. We've found the answer. True. Yes. The mushroom is here. It is in the list of blocks. Return true. Okay. So we're done. We're stopped calling. And this is just an illustration of the difference between iteration and recursion. Okay, so recursion encoding, and we're gonna go into the code a minute, hopefully make this even more concrete, right? Recursion is when a function calls itself to solve smaller and smaller problems. We call this the recursive step. So we're calling itself on smaller and smaller pieces of this list until it reaches the base case. The base case is something that the function knows the answer to, right? If, if I hit the mushroom, then I found it returned true, right? Um, then all the functions we've called ourselves inside ourselves, the functions all return and their results are kind of combined to solve the problem. Now we'll see some examples where there may be more than one base case, but we'll get there in a few minutes, okay? So we're gonna switch over to some code now. So um, if you haven't done it already, uh, switch over to your PyCharm editor and open the uh, examples for recursion example stubs, it's called. Okay. So let's look at a, we're gonna look at a trivial example of a function that can be solved both, uh, or a problem that can be solved both iteratively and recursively, and that's computing the factorial of a number, right? So um, how do you compute the factorial of something? So what do I mean by factorial? I mean compute and return n squared, n with the little exclamation mark, which is n factorial, right? So if you don't recall, what is 5 factorial? Well, 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, right? This is, how, this is the definition of factorial. So it's pretty easy to write an iterative method that solves this problem. Okay, so my iterative function takes uh, a value n, which is gonna be my integer that I compute the factorial of, and then four i in the range of one to n plus one, total times equals i, okay? So, you know, we can check this out. Let's compute the factorial of five. 
and I run my code and it's 120, right? Five times four is 20 times three, 20 times three is 60, 60 times two is 120, times one is 120. So that's my answer, right? So this is a very simple iterative solution because I'm using a loop here to solving the factorial. And you know, you can use it to solve whatever you want. 12 factorial is this large-ish number, right? 479 million, it looks like. Okay, so let's write a factorial function here that is uses a recursive solution. Okay, so a recursive solution has to do two things. One, uh, it has to call itself on smaller parts of the problem. And two, uh, it has to have a base case where it knows to stop. Okay, so the recursive approach to the factorial, right, is to think of, all right, well, what is five factorial? Well, it's five times what? Four times three times two times one. But we could rewrite this part as five times four factorial. Well, what's four factorial? Well, four factorial is four times three factorial, and so on and so forth, right? Is three times two factorial, right? And two factorial is two times one factorial. And one factorial is our base case. It's like the most trivial thing. What is one factorial? Well, one factorial is one, right? So this is a recursive approach to solving the factorial problem. Well, what does it look like in code? Okay, so whenever we're gonna code our recursive functions, usually what you wanna do is think of them from the base case on back, okay? So what is the base case here? When are we going to stop? Well, if our parameter is equal to one, okay, that's our trivial base case where we know how to stop. Well, one factorial is one, so let's return that, okay? But if n is not one, greater than one, hopefully, um, what do we wanna return? Well, we wanna return the value of n, whatever this was called with, so say it was five, it was called with five, right? We wanna return five times the factorial of n minus one. Well, what's n minus one? n minus one is four, okay? So um, what happens now is uh, when this code is called, let's call it right, factorial of five, right? The first time this code runs, right, the value of n is five, okay? If five equal equal one, well, that's not true. So our else clause will trigger. Return five times the factorial of n minus one. Well, n minus one, if n is five, it's calling factorial of four, okay? So then this code executes. Factorial of four, n equal one, no. Return factorial of four times factorial of n minus one, which will be three at this point. Right. So kind of what you wind up in is the situation where factorial keeps calling itself. This is the recursive step right here. Factorial is, excuse me, calling itself. But every time it calls itself, it makes it the parameter smaller, it makes the problem smaller. But you don't get that return value, right? So you're going to get a whole chain of these return n times factorial of n minus one times factorial of n minus one. You kind of have a big long chain of one another, them. But the actual return value, the final result, the final answer is not computed until you hit this base case and it returns one, okay? But uh, this solution should work, okay? So, oh, I still got my uh, 
guys up here. Okay. Oh, I gotta call it uh, it's inside the block. Okay. Five factorial five is one twenty. Let's do the factorial of uh, what did I do before twelve? Okay. There it is. So it's working, right? And you'll notice, right? These two are giving me the same answer. So yeah, we've got both a factorial, an iterative solution, and a recursive solution to this problem, right? One is looping over a range of values and, and calculating a running product. And the other is recursively calling itself and also in a way calculating a running product. Okay? So this is kind of a, it's a strange notion, it's a strange concept. Um, I'm gonna switch over to the worksheet now and illustrate it on paper and hopefully it'll make a little more sense what's going on inside the computer. So I'm in my worksheet now. Uh, I'm on, actually I'm on page two of the recursion worksheet. And I wanna talk here about how to think about and design your recursive algorithms and also how to trace them and think about how, what's going on inside the machine while they are executing, okay? So if you have to design an algorithm to solve a problem recursively, you need to remember there are two parts of a recursive algorithm. One is there's a base case, potentially more than one base case, where the algorithm stops because it knows the answer. And the second element is you have to have a recursive call to the function calling itself on a smaller piece of the problem. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, let's look at it in the context of our factorial function. Right? What is the base case of the factorial function? What is the thing we know the answer to? Well, the base case of the factorial function is when we want the factorial of n when n is equal to 1, right? 1 factorial is 1. We just know that that is truth, right? It's a trivial base case, right? So generally, you want to think about your base cases first. So our base case is going to be when n is equal or equal to 1, what we want to do is return one. Okay, so I'm going to use this little arrow to indicate we should return something. Right? Otherwise, else, you know, not the base case, what do we want to do? We want to return n, whatever the value of n is, right? If we call factorial of 5, n is 5, times, this is the recursive step, so we've got to call ourself, call the factorial function itself, factorial of n minus 1, right? And it's this n minus 1 step that is the recursive step that's going closer and closer, making the problem smaller and smaller. We're progressing toward the base case, right? If we keep doing n minus 1 enough times, eventually n will equal equal 1, and that's our base case that we know how to solve. Okay, so how do we trace this, right? We made a huge emphasis earlier in the semester on being able to trace program execution. Well, what I call it when you trace a recursive call is what is a slice trace, right? And what we're doing in the slice trace is we're gonna show the computed return value and any function parameters or local variables relevant to the computation. Okay, so let's just see an example. There's only one parameter one variable in play here, and that is n. So this keeps it relatively simple, all right? So we're gonna execute our code, right? Um, print the factorial of five, right? So the factorial of five, what is this gonna print? I don't know yet. I'm calling factorial function, and I need to wait for it to return before I know what to print, okay? So this is just gonna stay blank for a second, but we well, let's pretend that we've called this, this statement. All right, so the first time factorial is called, it's called with the where n has the value of what? Well, 5, because that was the argument that I called factorial with. All right, now let's refer to our pseudocode. What do we do? Well, if n equal equal 1, we return 1. n surely is not equal to 1. Um, so otherwise, we are returning n times factorial of n minus 1. All right, so we're going to return 5 
times what? Well, we don't know the answer yet. You know, more importantly, the computer doesn't know the answer yet. It just knows it's going to return five times something, but that something hasn't been computed yet. Okay, so what happens though? Well, the computer goes into another execution of the factorial function, right? These are nested calls. Uh, so you can almost think of these um, as being written out like this. If I can get my uh, pen to cooperate. You can almost think of these like this. Factorial of 5 is factorial 5 times factorial 4, right? Uh, and factorial of 4 times factorial of 3 times da, 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 da. you know there you can kind of think of them like this right they're kind of nested within one another it's, it's ugly in the program execution because what you're doing is every time you call one of these methods you're pushing it on top of the call stack and if you remember very early in the semester we we talked briefly about the call stack about how when you call a function uh, Python pushes onto the call stack where you just called it from, and then it goes and executes the function and returns back to where whatever's on top of the stack. Well, this is happening a lot with recursive functions, right? And the number of factorial calls on the call stack, well, that depends on um, how your recursive method is written. All right, but anyway, let's continue tracing this, okay? So this is calling, at this point, we were calling five times the factorial of n minus one. Well, what is the factorial of n minus one? So we wind up calling factorial again, where n, this time, it's not five, it's four. Okay, so, all right, factorial of four, base case, n equal equal one? Nope, not yet. So I'm going to return what? I'm going to return n, which is 4 in this case, right? I'm going to return 4 times at factorial of n minus 1. Well, I don't know what the answer to that is yet. I have to call my factorial function yet again. Except this time, I'm calling it with n equal to 3. Okay. So, again, go to your pseudocode. What is factorial of 3? Well, if n equal equal 1, we return 1. That's not the case. Else, you return 3 times factorial of n minus 1. Okay. <laughs> right? So this thing's getting kind of nuts. So, All right. So once again, we're calling factorial function. Meanwhile, all these guys, everybody up here, right, they're waiting for someone to to finally hit rock bottom here, to finally hit the base case and know the answer to it. They're all just kind of waiting and they're hanging in limbo. Right? Uh, I'm going to scroll down a little bit here since we should kind of see what's going on or know what's going on. So factorial gets called with n equal 2. 2 is still not our base case. right? So factorial of 2 returns 2 times factorial of n minus 1. Okay. Factorial, again, of n is 1. Aha, now I've hit my base case. So what do I return according to my base case? Well, when n equal equal 1, I just return 1. Okay, so finally I have an answer. And this, this particular version of factorial rec returns. It exits. It's done. It kind of goes away. Right? And now this value of 1 goes up here. Right? Aha! You have returned factorial of 1. What is your result? The result is 1. Aha! Now I can return, says factorial of 2. Right? And so he returns 2 times 1. 2 times 1 is, of course, 2. Right? And his job is done and he takes a nap. Okay? All right, factorial of three says, aha, at last you have returned to me. 
Aha, uh -huh, your answer was two, so then my answer, my return value is three times two, which is, of course, six. Okay, and my job is done. Right? What is factorial of four times six? Okay, well, I need to return four times six, which is 24. Okay, my job is done. I am done. And finally, the original factorial call, factorial of five, says, ah, what do I do? I finally got an answer from factorial of four, and his answer was 24. At last, I can now return five times 24. Do the arithmetic, five times 24 is 120. And finally, all the factorials are done. My print function prints 120 like we expect. Okay, so you should have in this mo in your mind that uh, when you're calling recursive functions, you are just kind of digging these holes deeper and deeper and deeper until you reach the base case at the bottom where you know the answer. And then you kind of percolate your results back up to the top and you have the answer to the question. Okay, so uh, in the next video, we'll just work through two more examples. We'll work through another trivial example of uh, determining if a word is a palindrome. And then we will apply this to a more practical example, which is binary search. All right, see you then.